feeling exhausted. I know. What day is it? Ah, Renee, we might get snow here in Seattle too. I, I left New York, missed the snow, and apparently snow is coming. <laughs> so excited. All right, let's begin. Welcome everybody to the first uh, conversation workshop of 2021, but the third of um, in the RIDC's lifetime so far. We're going to speak, be speaking with Jose Gonzalez today. Can you say hi, Jose? Hola, buenos, uh, buenas tardes. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to read a bit from his bio. Um, but, uh, and then we'll get started. So Jose Gonzalez, he, him, is the founder and former executive director for Latino Outdoors. He is an experienced educator as a K through 12 public education teacher, environmental education advisor, outdoor educator, education instructor, and coordinator and university adjunct faculty. His commentary on diversity and environmental outreach has been featured by High Country News, Outside, Earth Island Journal, and Latino USA. And he has been engaged in collaborations with the White House Council on Environmental Quality, US Department of Interior, and the National Park Service. He's also an amazing follow on Instagram. Highly recommend <laughs> that you follow him. He uh, just knows the right wild thing to say at the right moment. A few pieces of housekeeping before we get started. Um, you all will be muted. As I mentioned, you can keep your screens on or off. That's up to you. Um, next week, we, we will be hosting three stretch sessions that will be led by Jose. This is an incredible opportunity to delve more deeply into the material. Space is limited, but there are still spots available. So please sign up if you know that you can join and be engaged. Uh, this will be recorded. If you got here because someone forwarded you a link, but you had no idea where it actually came from, join us as a partner at runningdiversity.com and you will be in the loop with upcoming um, events and sessions. And um, yeah, did I say that Jose is amazing? Did I? Yes. Okay, Jose, take it away. <laughs> uh, thank you, Alice, and too kind. Well, first of all, uh, greetings, everybody. So my name is Jose Gonzalez, uh, for disclosure, Jose Guadalupe Adonis Gonzalez Rosales uh, de Leon. He, him, his, although I'll, offer, uh, I'll respond to anything offered with respect. Um, I greet you all from uh, traditional ancestral stolen unceded uh, lands of the, the Southern uh, Maidu, uh, Miwok, among others, and what is present day uh, Sacramento in California, or also Califa Sacrastlan, um, which may not mean anything to you, but it means something to me, and that is why I'm stating and offering into the space. And I'm starting with this because there'll be a couple of things uh, as before we jump into kind of the presentation component. Uh, uh, logistically speaking, uh, there will be a few opportunities for kind of uh, participant engagement, so to, so, so to speak. It doesn't mean I'm putting you into breakout rooms, what it means is I'll give you a prompt for you to kind of noodle on. Um, and if you're able to drop it in the chat in terms of your response, um, and if uh, helpful and appropriate, I may ask for one or two volunteers in terms of your response. And, and, and that will just be an invitation uh, as an example. Uh, we're not uh, going to go too much into detail because of the number of audience here. And then also because we'll have the stretch sessions as an opportunity. So, so just note that in that component. And I'm saying that so you don't feel like, oh, cool lecture, I'm gonna tune out um, because also it's gonna be useful for later. And that in terms of questions, we are gonna have some time at the end to kind of just focus on questions. So, um, so save those, especially if they're kind of the, you know, big like to have discussion questions. However, if there's any clarifying questions, meaning like, I really want to ask because I feel if, if I'm completely lost on this piece, it isn't going to help me, you know, move with you, then it's okay to, to kind of either put it in the chat so it grabs um, Allison's uh, or somebody else's attention uh, or, you know, worst kind of case scenario, you know, do your Zoom hand or unmute, uh, especially once I'm in presentation mode and I'm, I may not be able to notice it or catch it in that regard. Yeah. Uh, and last and not least, these are, of course, the times that we're in. Um, pandemic uh, being uh, front and centered and hence why we're meeting in this way. 
So do what you need to kind of care for yourself. That means that if you need the camera off for a particular point to do that, um, if you end up with a cat filter, um, you all know what I'm talking about, that's okay. Uh, and as the significant others, uh, pets, any other uh, loved ones, human and not wander in, uh, that'll be fine as well. Um, but know that the, the main thing would just be to try to hold and support the space for each other. So pay attention for that in terms of how we mute, unmute, uh, uh, or um, bring any distractions into the space. So that'd be the main thing. Awesome. So um, unless I missed anything else, Allison, I'll go ahead and jump in. Let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, and Teresa Baker's uh, embarrassing comments and affirmations will be welcome as well. Perfect. All right. So let me make sure I got the right one here. Perfect. All right. So you all should be able to see what I'm seeing, which is uh, a pigeon being microaggressed. Um, and, and if not, at any point, Allison, jump in and like, let me know if, 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 if we can't see or hear something in case I, I, I lose that. Gotcha. Uh, and the focus of today is bias. So it means there's a lot we can talk about. Um, and so we, we won't talk about a, a lot of that stuff. Um, and even within bias, there's a lot that we can talk about. And so this is kind of condensed as it is. So just want to acknowledge that some of it may be dense, some of it may move fast for you. Make notes, take notes, write down questions. The idea isn't that you have to get it all like right now. It might just be enough to say, that looks interesting to me. I want to follow up on that. Um, that didn't make sense to me. So maybe that's a good series of questions for the stretch session and so forth. Um, and that my goal isn't to like convince you and say, I'm absolutely 100% right. And so if you don't agree with me, you're wrong. Uh, at the same time, I will, I have a boundary to kind of say that if we're challenging, <laughs> if, if we have no agreements on, on some uh, uh, points of commonalities, and that's a separate conversation. So what I will present is information, um, which is uh, research based. Uh, and then we can always follow up with like the appropriate studies or the appropriate articles or the appropriate researchers to, to dig a little deeper um, in, in terms of doing that. So just kind of front loading that as we get going. And what we'll really kind of uh, jump into is kind of the here's what, the so what, and the now what um, of implicit cognitive bias. For the here's what, it'll just be a little bit to touch on like what are we talking about when, 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 when we, use the, we use the word bias. Um, the so what is why does it matter in this space? Just knowing about bias isn't enough. In fact, it might not do much. Um, and that's a fair critique. Often you see a lot of articles written to say like, all these implicit bias trainings don't really do anything. And then I look at them and, 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 and look, actually read them. I'm like, you know, I agree. But that's because <laughs> that's, like, that's like telling runners, like all you need is to own a pair of running shoes. I'm like, no, you actually have to put them on. You actually have to go and run. And then you actually have to have a, you know, more to that. Um, so that's gonna be uh, important for it. And then the now what, we'll touch on a couple of examples on like, how do you mitigate it? How, 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 then how do you do something about it? Um, so that it can set you up to connect with other trainings, other workshops, other sessions um, to touch on. I already shared, a, you know, introduced myself a little bit. And given the number of people here, we're not gonna do a whole group introduction. However, an introduction is still useful and important so that A, as you move as a cohort, as a group of communities, pay attention to how you um, uh, wanna be seen, uh, and, uh, be seen, heard and valued essentially in this space, how you wanna be visible. So those are little things like ensuring that your Zoom name um, is your name, that it has the pronouns that are important to you so that as you begin to engage with each other, uh, you're supporting in that way. Uh, so just want to put that component as well. And then when we uh, get an opportunity to be like in, in stretch sessions, for example, uh, will afford us an opportunity for a bit more community building. I'm gonna put that as well. And then I may use some meme references that may make sense to you, that may not make sense to you, uh, that is okay. If it gets in the way of your comprehension, don't hesitate to ask. And so in terms of getting started, 
Um, a key component will be that we'll talk about, uh, I'll present you an example of agreements. And we won't have the time to do agreement settings uh, here with you, but I wanna mention them because they're an important component of when you're gonna be in groups with each other and especially about learning and engaging with like the challenging and difficult stuff that have to do with social justice, with racial justice, with anti-oppression work, with anti-racism work, uh, with like dismantling dominant normative culture and so forth. It is important to, to, to pay attention to how do we agree to be with each other if we have a common goal of, of working to this. Otherwise, it's not surprising that you might end up conflict oriented and you'll spend your time arguing, um, fighting each other and harming each other more rather than thinking about like, yeah, some stuff's gonna come up and it's gonna be hard, but we have a, we, these are agreements that will help us move together um, and, and, and pay attention to the space that you're in so that if you fall in the chocolate river, that's your fault. All right, so some agreements of engagement, these are examples. Curiosity, lean in for learning, right? When if something uh, is new and different, there's a difference between saying, huh, interesting. Let me, let me lean in with some curiosity rather than like, no, that's dumb. I don't agree with that. Um, try it on, it's understanding the discomfort and risk are a source of growth. It is being able to say like, Ooh, okay, that's, ah, goodness, I feel uncomfortable about that. But let me try it out and see, see why maybe I feel uncomfortable. Maybe because it is a new experience. And that's no different than trying on a new pair of running shoes and then realizing, okay, maybe I just, maybe I, I've never worn these before. So maybe this is what it feels like to break them in. Weight is a self check to kind of sometimes pay attention how you are taking uh, up space. So weight, uh, as an example is why am I talking? That's an acronym. It can also be why ain't I talking or why aren't I talking? As an invitation to sometimes say, sometimes you take up too much space and it's okay to just, just wait. Uh, and other times uh, you may have a really cool idea, but if you're overly conscious of your introvert itself, as an example, you might uh, not gift the group with a brilliant insight that you think may not be brilliant, um, but who knows until you offer it. Rough draft um, is that it's okay in some of these components, and especially these will be useful for the, um, for the stretch session is uh, as Dr. Carolyn Finney uh, likes to say, it's okay to keep it raggedy. These don't have to be polished thoughts. You don't have to be like, oh no, I don't, you know, I don't want to say this and sound like I can't not quote unquote eloquent or something. It's okay. And you can just name it. This is my rough draft thinking. Uh, or I'm going to stumble to it because I'm still, uh, it's new to me. And I'm realizing that uh, I have to kind of struggle with it. And that's okay because it's new language, it's new terminology. It might be you're developing a fluency. Uh, your, uh, in terms of your thoughts, in terms of engagement. And then big picture and the shared goals is to, these will be important to know that there are always points in which we can get stuck on. Um, so there's a difference between saying, what's the goal we're trying to get to so that we can figure out multiple ways of getting there compared to being stuck on a particular way of getting there. Um, another way that I often think about that is like, think about how you're soft on the people, hard on the problem, flexible on the means, but fixed on the ends, um, especially when you're gonna get stuck. And that agreements of engagements, uh, group agreements, working agreements, norms, there's all kinds of different names for these. It's really to say what is gonna help us get there. And they can be different and they can be unique and tailored for you. So as an example, these are the ones I use for myself, right? That I'm not saying these are the magic five you should get, but it gives you an idea of when I can pay attention to the difference between intent and impact and what does passion and compassion look like in this work and how does difference and discomfort show up? How do I commit to ego check? And also knowing that this is hard, what does liberated joy look like? So that collective um, element of play, of being with each other is one where we're moving with some of that joy, knowing that there's already, it's already gonna be pretty hard as it is. Uh, oh, and uh, I forgot to mention that we will have this available to you afterwards. So take notes that are helpful for you. Don't feel you have to take notes to capture something that you'll never, ever, 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 ever see again. So before I jump into kind of the, the, the bias stuff, I have two um, 
a pieces here to anchor what we're talking about to kind of the big picture. Because uh, um, often we uh, talk about like diversity, you know, quote unquote DEI, or uh, what's the right acronym, or what are the right words to use, and as if like there's just new ideas we need to catch up with. But really, uh, the reason why this is anchored in the importance of why we do this, it's because the, um, there's a demographic inevitability. The demographics of the US, for example, of 1950 are um, very different than how they're gonna be in 1950. And so that has um, impact uh, on, on the reality that we're in. And that in the 1960s, you know, we managed to actually do away with the actual laws <laughs> that said, if you are not white, you have to use a different entrance. You have to use a different uh, facility. Uh, you can uh, be in specific public spaces and not in specific places. And that this is not ancient history. This is the, the lived experience of one generation. Um, and so it's one thing to say, okay, by law, we're not gonna do this anymore. It's another thing to, to think that the culture changed overnight and the power dynamics uh, changed overnight. They did not. So as we move from then to now, and as the decision-making spaces will, will be changed, and then who is represented in the, in the spaces of power and decision-making, so elected officials, for example, um, those that are on boards, uh, the heads of organizations, as that shift, it has implications uh, for this work. And so just diversity based on tolerance to say, oh yeah, there's different people, so what? Oh, oh that's nice, okay. I recognize that. It's very different than saying, huh, I uh, now understand the need and value that those that are very different than me, a different lived experience, and for example, based on race, uh, are now going to be leading these spaces. Uh, and that, can, that is an invitation to change the way that things have been done and the rationale and the underpinnings and why. And we either work with that in ways that collectively get there, or we move through a lot of resistance, challenge, and breaking. And the US is a really good example of how to do both of those, right? And we see that manifesting politically, socially, and culturally. And it's also part of the reason why, you know, when, when, uh, why many of us are very present and vocal about this. And so these questions of uh, diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion, um, are really the way that I approach this is to say they're centered on this idea of power. So diversity isn't just like, we're all different. Like, yes, we are all different. Uh, and well, we're all human. Yes, we're also all human. However, there are real life implications to how some difference manifests in such way that it negatively impacts some more than others. So I, we might be different in terms of belly buttons and you know, some of us are any, some of us are outies. But that isn't impact the way that we interact with law enforcement in the same way that skin color does, right? And so that's an example. And, and we've seen clear examples of that historically, but also recently, uh, including with Cooper um, birding in Central Park, right? Like those are clear examples of what this manifests. And so we show this picture because there's many different types of these pictures. Uh, uh, to kind of show fences and, and trying to see the game or see the sunset and so forth. I'm using these to kind of stress the point that when we talk about e equity and equality, it's acknowledging a different starting point. That different starting point is slavery, for example. That different starting point is indigenous genocide. It's like we have created very different starting points um, that, uh, historically. And so we treat equality as giving everybody the same, it doesn't count for the fact that not everyone's starting at the same spot. So if our intention and goal is one of equality of access, then that means we need to provide equitable resources you know, to see the game, to see the sunset, to see over the fence. Uh, and that justice-oriented work ultimately is about saying, are there fences though or barriers that we can tear down? Are there reasons as to, um, those are in place and that they should uh, or shouldn't need to be in place. Um, and that's long-term work, but other times it is, you know, this is the difference of saying, 
do we need to have laws that segregate around race? Right, that was an element because prior to that, the separate and equal was being able to say, oh no, yeah, we can, as long as everybody's getting the resources they need to leave segregated lives, we should be okay, right? And, and it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't by principle and it wasn't by practice. So a justice oriented work was to say, get rid of, of, um, of those legal barriers in that example. So why this is connected to bias is because bias is a, can be a starting point for us to recognize, well, how do those fences end up being put up in the first place? <laughs> why do we have arguments around equitable resources? And then we think, well, that's just reverse uh, discrimination uh, or it's affirmative action and it's bad. Um, it's because we can start thinking at the internal components of what do we reinforce um, that ends up showing up systemically um, and how do we account for that in relating to each other? So, hence this idea of, of, of implicit bias. Um, and, and Allison, like I said, I can't see the chat. Uh, so if any questions come up, just let me know. I got you. Awesome. So th three things on implicit cognitive bias. And I put implicit cognitive uh, because it's this idea that it's not conscious. Um, and it's cognitive because we're gonna, we're talking about you know, the, the way that the brain is wired. Uh, so this is very different than intentional or explicit <laughs> uh, discrimination. Uh, it's related, but it's different. And so the three things will be understand it and identify it, um, accept it, and, and what its implications are, and then what do we do about it, as I mentioned. So here's an example. I'm gonna read this, and then uh, I will ask you to drop in the chat just kind of what you think, what's your response. Um, I will read this uh, as you can also read it yourself. So the mountain bikers didn't realize when they started their nearly 2000 mile journey from Missoula that they would have to deal with hail and eight foot snow drifts. They were a self-sufficient unit, each biker carrying their own rations, cookware, tent and other necessities. But after crossing the Yellowstone and Little uh, Bighorn rivers, they were tired and hungry and only halfway to St. Louis where their mountain bike trek would end and they still hadn't gotten, uh, oops, let me see. And they still hadn't gotten to the, uh, I can't, I'm blocking myself out. Well, you can read the rest part of that. Sorry, my, my, my menu is, is blocking. Oops, there we go. So the question is that we're gonna ask is, that isn't stated here, but without overthinking, without overthinking it, if you're overthinking it, you're already uh, went one step too many. Um, what is the race and ethnicity uh, of these mountain bikers? There is no right or wrong answer, by the way. I'm not, it's not a gotcha either. So drop that in the chat. We've got no way of knowing white males, white males, white men, most likely white men. Yep. Awesome. Thank you for sharing some of those. And the idea isn't here that's like, yes, you're supposed to think uh, white men. Um, and that yes, it is uh, understandable or uh, uh, what I'm trying to get is like, well, I have no way of knowing that is true because it isn't stated. And if you were to engage your mental picture, what would come up? Because that's the real question that we're getting at to then be able to investigate how is it that a picture uh, comes up? And, and uh, not just the how is it in terms of where it comes from, but how our brain is predisposed to fill in information that we don't know. Um, so there's that component. And so that if an image such as this is what comes out, it makes sense. So I'm just kind of Google mountain biker um, and you see kind of common imagery in terms of what might be on the cover of mountain biking magazines and promotional material and so forth. And yes, you can all, of course make the argument, well, you know, they're all wearing clothes, so I can't really tell. Uh, it's still okay. Um, uh, what I'm trying to get at is, it is still quote unquote normal um, to be able to say white men because it is recognizable. So what I'm saying is you wouldn't be wrong in that respect. And so the, the question uh, that you can drop in the chat box or just think to yourself is, is that to be able to ask, where did the images in your mental picture come from? 
did you have your own internal Google search engine? Uh, and then it's like, it just fills it in. Um, are you cautious? And you're like, well, I don't want to say it. So it's, I'll just be like, who knows, right? I will, um, I don't really know. And of course, what is the impact if you pictured the main characters to be man or white? You don't have to answer, you don't have to expect a complete answer on these because this is where we're going to get to. This is just giving you an example um, that, that of, of beginning uh, to kind of pay attention to it. And Allison, I'll defer to you because there's. Yeah, so we've got assuming that white men are the default magazine. Somebody said outside magazine. There was a call out there. Yeah. Uh, endurance sports. Um, somebody, Tiffany had said uh, something which I, I kind of giggled at, but only white men would travel that far or take on that. I forget yeah. exactly what she said. Uh, there are some um, notes about the expenses and the resources that it would require. So therefore they thought white. Uh, Vanessa says, from what I've experienced in the media and experienced myself or the experience of my friends and families. And Lulu corrected me, not calling out, calling in. Thank you, Lulu. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much then. That's what's great, great, what great practicing by everybody. So those are really good examples. Um, and that example that, that, that I read out to you is actually based on an actual quote unquote real example. And this is who they are. Uh, some of the first, if not the first mountain bikers, uh, which are Buffalo soldiers. Um, so here they are back in the late 1800s. I think this was 1890 something. Um, as they are mountain biking their way, uh, just as I described. Um, and so what, this is an example of being able to begin to, to hold complexity in what may be, um, you know, sometimes we talk about multiple truths, but I also, and I also say it about saying you can hold ideas that kind of are challenging each other <laughs> and that's still okay. So on one end, it is affirming and exciting to be able to say, huh, this is not the 1980s Marin County in California story that I think I've often heard too much about like the birth and creation of mountain biking that is a story and that is a core point, but it wasn't the, the only story, if not the first story, you had this happen as well. And so it can be highly affirming, right? To be able to say someone that may not see themselves represented in an industry, someone that now might see themselves represented in, a, in an outdoor activity, then realize like, wait a minute, my ancestors were doing this. <laughs> they were doing this a long time ago. So you can have that. And then also have the question come up. It's like, why were they the ones doing this? Why were they the experimental battalion or unit? Uh, how, are there reasons why they would be considered um, the unit to try things out on, right? And so those be begins those kind of questions in addition to understanding and why are they the ones out in this experience um, in their role and in, in, in respect of engagement uh, with native communities? Right? That, that, that's part of the complex story. Um, and I think that's, that's an important component to, to begin to, to, to hold and tease out. All right, we're gonna do another quick activity um, and then uh, I'll do more presentation. So for this one is, uh, again, don't overthink it. Uh, and, and you can always come back later and, and, and give it more thought or fill it in. This is just more as, as a type of example. So the idea is that you can write down the names and initials of five people you trust the most who are not part of your family. This is presuming that obviously your family are people you trust. <laughs> so that, that's why we're saying not part of your family. Um, it's just really to think about what are five individuals you deeply trust. You, know, you define trust in a way that's important to you. Um, I often joke to say, who am I going to call it to in the morning if I need to get bailed out? Um, and, and that, you know, I, 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 that they will follow through <laughs> uh, and that they'll take care of me. Uh, so that's an example. Um, and so, the, and then uh, write out, so I'm giving you here one, two, three, four, five, six types of some columns and categories to quickly fill out um, uh, where they are. If you know, if you don't know, make your best guess. 
Um, and if you really, really don't know, it's okay to leave it blank. Again, this is just for the exercise. So for me, I would put Jose, I'm um, quote unquote white. Yeah, it's a controversial thing, but whatever, I'm going by the census definition. Uh, but I'll put Latinx uh, in terms of race, ethnicity, uh, gender identity, man, uh, sexual orientation, uh, heterosexual, age 39, education, high degree, class, middle class. Class, just kind of go by that socioeconomic class. We can have differences of that. Again, that's not the point here. It'll just be to kind of say, we're painting a picture. Uh, and then just the initials or the names, because you're not going to share this with the group right now. But just do this as a quick exercise. And, and um, I can maybe time it for 30 seconds to a minute as you're doing that. Okay. And I'll move slowly as we are in workshop mode. In this case, we won't always have time to complete everything, and that's okay. Uh, a key thing is that you have the opportunity to, to, to see what the exercise is getting at. And because the guiding questions for this is to kind of begin to notice what patterns and themes emerge for you. Uh, and what is the uh, what is the impact in our when our circle of trust um, looks a lot like us? So, for example, a pattern or theme might emerge to say, "Huh, the majority of them are all the same gender," uh, or they're all the same gender, uh, or like, "Huh, we all have the same education level or status," uh, or uh, we all we're all this um, you know we, we're all of the same race and ethnicity. And, and again, the question here is what's the impact? It's not evaluative or judgmental. So it isn't, this isn't meant to tell you like you're right or wrong for what it looks like. It'll just be the invitation for us to consider the effects um, of that. So I'll pause in case there are any uh, comments that are being dropped or shared and I'll defer to Allison as well. Yeah, nothing yet, but I'm looking at um, my group of all black, mostly heterosexual middle-class folks <laughs> and the, the impact um, thinking still thinking about that mm -hmm. okay, I'll just give a little bit more time for people as they're completing and processing this made me reflect about they all have the same education mm -hmm. Bruce, I'll tell you the categories quickly. It was race, gender, uh, sexual identity, education, and uh, oh, there you go. <laughs> Doing this makes me think that bias can feed bias. So it's not so static. Yeah. Great comment. Okay. And I wanted to stress that part about not evaluate of judgmental to kind of say like, oh no, it's all the same. Uh, that's bad. That's not what we're getting at. So uh, I'll put this because we'll touch on this, uh, that in some cases there, you know, because of how trust is defined for you, having everybody be more like you, so to speak, is a safe space. It's a comfortable space because you're so used to engaging in spaces that are so taxing <laughs> because of how you treat it differently. That's like, ah, this is the space that I can just be more like myself. Uh, in other cases, um, you are so used to your external spaces supporting you that you have the opportunity uh, to have a lot more variety uh, in who you engage with uh, in terms of who you trust. So I wanna put that, uh, I wanna make that clear uh, in terms of there may be different reasons for doing that. Uh, and it's, that's not the point about saying that's good or bad, it's for us to then begin to consider the effects, the effects of that. And there can be multiple. And lastly, I'll offer this one. Let's see if it'll work. Um, some of you may be familiar with this one. The question is, which uh, of the two tables, which has, which one's bigger at the top? Which was the host, which has the most surface area? Um, or what's the key difference? So some of you might say that this one's longer, that one's shorter. 
So that's the prompt. Tony says they're the same. Yeah. And they are the same. Um, part of that is to kind of know you can actually do this physically as well and cut them out. That is also the same thing. It isn't meant to like trick you into trying to guess differently. Is that if you did guess differently saying one is long or it looks longer, or even if I know that they're the same, I can still look at the one on the left and say, that one definitely looks longer. And the one on the right just looks shorter. It's because it's an example of how our brain is beginning to take surrounding information based on our experience and then be able to say that this is, this is why. Even if the information presented to you is such that they are this, the tops are the same. I just want to put that in there in terms of like not feeling like, well, of course I know they're the same. That's the obvious answer. And then if you don't get that feeling like, well, I feel like I'm getting it wrong. So just want to put that in terms of a comment. And so this starts with information. So uh, the key thing, the key takeaway here is as an example from a study is that the human brain can process 11 million bits of information every second. So that's 11 million right now. That's another 11 million right now. That's another 11 million right now and going on and on. But at the same time, our conscious minds are only processing about 40 to 50. So that means 99.99995-ish or so uh, of the information that you're intaking is unconscious. So that's the key difference, conscious and unconscious. Still getting in there somewhere. Um, but you're not consciously processing it. I had a professor of a professor of a professor of, a professor of um, conscious bias at uh, the University of Oregon say that like sometimes people forget that they think that you're not taking it in, but you are. It's just how much you're consciously processing it. And so this is what we're going to really lean into this idea of these cognitive shortcuts. Also, uh, sometimes they're called heuristics. How do those lead us? Um, how are they guiding us into this bias component? And then of course the consequences of that. And so uh, I think there's a book called System One and System Two or Slow and Fast Thinking. Uh, the idea here is that we have, we, you can think of two general ways <laughs> of thinking of how our brain think around this. And this mental process called System One is kind of the one that's in charge of like, quick, you need to decide right now. Um, that kind of spontaneous make a decision. It's you know, kind of your gut instinct, but it's really guided by your amygdala. Uh, you might have heard that kind of as your reptilian brain. Uh, like that's the first, that's our, that's, that's, that's our first brain that developed to keep us alive. And so in this one, we, when we make decisions in a very rush, rushed manner, it's basically that part of the brain kind of saying, quick, use, use information you already have that's available, your stereotypes and templates to decide. Um, and that amygdala uh, is what's really good about responding to fear or threat. So think about that fight or flight mode. That's what quickly gets activated to be like, are you safe or not? Decide. Because if you consciously think about it, it might be too late. So um, let me see if it's here. So if you are all of a sudden need to say, well, I think that might be a tiger. Not really sure. I can't see the whole thing. I see stripes. Um, but then, you know, what do I know? Maybe it just, it could, even if it is a tiger, uh, let me get close to find out. Uh, and maybe it just wants to chill. So part of the theory is that most of the people that made those decisions didn't survive, right? Early on in terms of our evolutionary adaptive process. And so this is that the theory that's based on that is the, the belief that our distant ancestors had to make very quick decisions about how to survive. Uh, and make decisions about who's part of the group or not in terms of also accessing resources. Uh, this idea of, of how you're developing trust um, and where you, uh, uh, which are the areas of safety and comfort. Uh, and so these are kind of these, these, these primal formations of the in and out groups. Um, and so that can help explain the adaptive process, kind of the evolution of it. And so what we are now is be able to say, um, that is not the environments we live in now. So we can't use them to excuse our behavior. We don't have the same kind of threat or fear. 
Um, so uh, we can use this to acknowledging how the learning process, how we begin to intake this information and what we do with it and learn, do this, don't do that. While that may have some hardwiring, our kind of software uh, and, and, and kind of how we're teaching our brains um, is up to us. So that's a key, uh, that's a, a key critical component, hence the tiger. And so hence this idea of unconscious cognitive implicit bias, right? Thinking about the result of our social condition and cognitive processes. So it isn't just the brain, it, it isn't just the nurture and the nature, and the nature is both of them. How they develop on these uh, unconscious, subtle, involuntary assumptions or judgments we make every day based on our prior experiences and culture uh, on top of that uh, neural wiring. So they're kind of the glasses that we see through the world <laughs> with the irony that sometimes we take some glasses off and there's other glasses. Uh, there's some glasses we can't take off and that's okay. Um, so hence that component. And if you really you know, get excited about deep digging into when we talk about the biology uh, of, of the neurology is to be able to say, uh, you may have heard the expressions that uh, neurons that fire uh, together wire together is that we can have experiences that reinforce each other. And so for, um, and then that's what these neurons then begin to say, hey, I noticed that this experience seems to be really important to you. So I'm gonna make all these connections um, to make it easier for you <laughs> to, to just make those decisions or, or get that experience. This is the development of expertise. And I, that can also be concerning because you can develop the arrogance of expertise to, to then presume that because it's easy for you, it should be easy for somebody else, forgetting that you actually have to build that experience. And those are questions that you might say, well, duh, why don't you get it? I got it. Yeah, well, you've been dealing with that uh, for, for a long time and you forgot what it's like to have a learner um, experience or a learner starting point. I'll pause, Allison, if I've missed any questions. No, you're good. My mind is being blown. Keep going. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so the simplicity of bias, you know, this is kind of a key takeaway. This is this, this slide right here to say, it's how our brain makes, this, makes um, sense of information when we receive too much information. So it's filtering, right? It's those 40 to 50 bits. Um, if it was taking all 11 uh, million, we'd be in so much decision paralysis. It's just, it's too much. Um, however, it's also when we receive too little information. So like that tiger in the grass, we didn't need to see the whole tiger to fill in the tiger. Um, however, that's also how optical illusions work because it gives us just enough information and our brain then begins to, to fill it in. We, because our brains like to still make meaning. They still wanna make sense of the world um, to, for it to be predictable. Uh, and we need to act fast. So we are wired to act on the present. Uh, you know, case studies um, where they ask kids, you know, would you like to have a cookie right now? Or if you wait, you can have two cookies. And it's not surprising for them to say it, uh, especially for just, you know, when, when they're early in their cognitive development, you're like, well, of course, I cook you right now. <laughs> um, and so that's important because it's also meant that when we were in our uh, cave thinking days, we, you know, we couldn't wait. We didn't know when the next meal was going to be available, when the next good hunting ground, when the next space uh, was going to happen. And so like, let's get this now. Unfortunately, it's, uh, there's a phrase to kind of say that's kind of cave thinking, uh, cave thinking uh, wired and mentality, but now we, we're in capitalistic abundance. And so our biology is still kind of adaptive to kind of say, heck yeah, if it's fat, salt and sugar, get as much of it right now because you never, you don't know when you're gonna get it next. Unfortunately, you know, there, we, we have access to, we have, now we have, uh, too easy access to Twinkies uh, and, and the like. So, and that's the balance and challenge, right? So I'm just putting that as an example to, in terms of how we, we are fighting against um, our environments, how we're wired in some of those ways. And it's the lens that is shaped by prior experiences and background and culture, um, how to begin to shape the world. So those three things, too much information, too little information, we wanna act at the moment. Oops, let me see. 
and there's a lot of them. The idea here isn't to like memorize and remember all these biases because <laughs> there's a lot. Um, and so these bias maps right, can show us to kind of say like, wow, the trick isn't to say, well, I know for sure right now that I'm definitely being affected by this type of affinity bias. Um, and so with these, the, the, I said affinity bias because with the circle of trust, that's an example of affinity bias, kind of like birds of a feather flock together. And so that is an example of how we're biased to, to the more of those who are like us. And that's also adaptive and evolutionary. And so one useful thing will be to then start breaking this into how they broke it up here, which is really useful to think about, well, um, what do I do when, what are my biases that affect when I have too much information? What are my biases when I don't have enough information uh, and don't have enough meaning? What are my biases when I need to act fast or when I'm acting fast? And then what are my biases that help me remember or not remember stuff? Because as humans, we're also predisposed to remember all the bad stuff, which again, it's adaptive because we want to not repeat that. <laughs> we want to avoid that in the future. And we can be bad about remembering the good stuff. Um, and also we're just bad at remembering. Uh, so that's, you can do things about that. You can actually practice memory building but it's not a guarantee that how we remember it is actually how it happened. And there's examples where they show people to say, describe me how that went. And they're like, yeah, I remember it so clearly. And then they'll show you video of it. It's like, that's not exactly how you remembered it. You're being selective about how you remembered it. Um, and here's clear gaps. And this is also an example why eyewitness reports can be, can be problematic in terms of who, what we remember and why we remember that. So then, oh, one second, not that. I forgot I included these in here. So these are examples of those kind of cognitive biases that can be, so you see different examples of these kind of pop up, right? That are offered to kind of um, short in, in, in um, articles and so forth. And so um, that's the key thing to remember here. And that bias is adaptive and we have it often because we're filtering, we don't know enough, we're primed to act fast. And this is what's building our cognitive models of the world. This is what's telling us this is what the world looks like. And I need this information so that I can move in the world without having to consciously make the same decisions over and over again. This, these are my mental shortcuts. Um, so that's part of the component. And so the problem then isn't having bias, we're all bias. That's the first acceptance, right? That's the first step um, in, in, our, in, our, in our group. Uh, awareness. I'm biased, you're biased, we're all biased. Um, so for someone that says, well, I'm not biased, I'm like, that's a separate conversation. Um, that's like saying, well, that's, that's not the same, but it's like when people say I'm colorblind, I'm saying, okay, so then you're choosing not to see particular things. Or what you're saying is that you're choosing not to see different things. It's about when the bias connects with the isms, the ideologies. And the ideologies are these especially um, when these ideologies are harmful in the way that we begin to separate people in such ways that they have negative impact and that we have people in positions of power that can have decisions that negatively impact in that way. So hence this conversation around systemic inequalities, systemic inequities and so forth, uh, and that it can be challenging because they can be, I think somebody you know, mentioned self-reinforcement. So we can have um, unconscious bias uh, alone doesn't excuse systemic inequalities um, because systemic and structural biases can lead to some of these individuals and in interpersonal uh, um, biases that reinforce racism and racist belief and prejudice, but then they also in turn reinforce the systemic and structural. So it's important to kind of look at that cycle and then our ability to be able to interrupt that. Um, so that's that key component. Um, this one I'm not going to read, but I'm presenting it as an example of what we mean about like having a bias and then that there's a structural component. Um, there is an example around the space, the, the space telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, um, and that scientists need to allocate time. They need to request and say, hey, I want to use the telescope for my, for my study, for my project. Um, so they, you know, they submit their request and then a committee, a council, like looks through all of them and then decides, okay, you can have it, you can't and so forth. 
Um, and how it was uh, wor how it was working was that it wasn't, you could see clear, um, based on who got in, who didn't, you could see a clear disparities around gender. Basically, if you were a woman or woman-led projects, you weren't getting as much time as the men uh, uh, overall, and of course, uh, in terms of representative. So there was a statistically significant disparity. That was what kind of the component is. So here's an example where there can be an ism, an ideology of say um, sexism, combined with a structural element, re allocation of resources, <laughs> decision-making, people in power. And what ends up happening is that if you're a woman scientist, then you're less likely to benefit. You're more negatively impacted by this. Um, and that that, has, that obviously affects your career. <laughs> that affects how you advance in the field and so forth. So we'll come back to this. And again, we'll be able to share the, all of these at, afterwards at the end. Um, and so an example of this type of interaction is something that's very familiar to many of us, which is stereotypes. Um, these widely held but oversimplified ideas about a person based on their identities, real and perceived. Unfortunately, this video doesn't really exist anymore. Um, it's If you haven't seen it, I believe you can still find it on Facebook, which is Black Hiker, but I'm starring Blair Underwood. I recommend you check it out as an example um, of that. Okay. Let me just make sure that I'm continuing off here. Perfect. Um, and that that's important to acknowledge because it can be, um, kind of like with the mountain biker example, that you, be, you may begin to narrow the narrative um, and lead to the danger of a single story. And so the idea here isn't that that story in and of itself may be bad, it could be, but that if we narrow it such that it becomes the stereotype and becomes the definitive, it, be, it can lead to being the definitive story of that other person, of that other community. And you're not accounting uh, for a wider spectrum and nuance of that narrative and story. You, you completely leave the Buffalo soldiers out uh, in their role in mountain biking. Or maybe you only reduce the Buffalo soldier story to one particular facet and it, you miss an, uh, an opportunity for wider interconnection. Um, another one, and I'll only do two examples here, there's, there's more, is microaggressions. Uh, and I share this because stereotypes is kind of one that we've, we've known for a while or longer. Microaggressions may be one that might be newer to some people uh, as a term. And these are the unconscious everyday behaviors that often unintentionally disempower someone based on a marginalized identity. So this one, um, I mentioned intent and impact. You can think of this as an example of that gap that happens between my good intent <laughs> And that doesn't mean it ended up as good impact. I, I could have had good intent and it still ends up, that's the unintentional, it can still have ended up with um, harmful impact. And even more so, cause you're thinking, but if I had good intent, isn't that enough? Or I had good intent, how could it possibly be that there was negative impact? It's because you're not accounting um, for the different lived experience and how that harm can accumulate and perpetuate. Um, some of them may be very obvious. Some of them may be very subtle. So like, what are you? Are you a man or a woman? Um, why do you sound white? Wow, you're really articulate. Where are you really from? Uh, you're a much better driver than expected. I didn't, you know, I didn't, uh, I, I didn't picture you as a runner. Or you run? Uh, they can be, Questions that you say, well, I was just surprised. And so it's investigating why, <laughs> what caused that, that surprise and what might that be based on? Um, let me see if I'm good on time. Okay, so far so good. So pause it by showing this a video. Uh, I think some of you may have seen this. If you haven't, um, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, hopefully that will play right now. If it doesn't play, we'll, we'll, we'll move forward. So I, um, I want to add a note to some of this video and, and other such examples that they're, and they're intended to be funny. So they're made with the purpose uh, of humor. So it's okay to laugh. And that speaking of like holding uh, multiple um, 
emotions with it. And that it can also be a painful reminder for some people to be like, that's exactly what that feels like. And it's frustrating or it reminds me of how much I have to put up with. So I just want to put that to kind of say it isn't, if it's funny, it's okay to laugh and acknowledging that this can be a reminder of just how much it sucks or how it hurts or like what the microaggressions you might have to uh, move with. Okay, make sure I haven't missed anything. All right, let's see if this plays. And so please check your, your respective uh, uh, headphones and audios on your end. Actually, let me pause. Can you, oops, can you hear it? Hi yes. There. Okay, good. Hi. Nice day, huh? Yeah, finally, right? Where are you from? Your English is perfect. San Diego. We speak English there. Oh, I don't know that. <clears throat> Where are you from? Well, I was born in Orange County, but I never actually lived there. Uh, I mean before that. Before I was born. Yeah, like, well, where are your people from? Well, my great grandma was from Seoul. Korean. I knew it. I was like, she's either Japanese or Korean, but I was leaning more towards Korean. Amazing. <laughs> I'm Shasuna. There's a really good teriyaki barbecue place in Orange Park. I actually really like kimchi. Cool. What about you? Where are you from? San Francisco. But where are you from? No, I'm not from San Francisco. Really? You're Native American? No, uh, just regular American. Oh, well, uh, I guess my grandparents are from England. Oh, well. Hello, Gamda! What's all this then? Top of the morning to you, the gas parties, party! Double, double, toil and trouble! Find a gap, beware, Jack the Ripper! Bloody hell! Whip, whip, cheerio! I think your people's fish and chips are amazing. Mm -hmm. Really? Weird? Must be a Korean thing. Okay, so I'll pause there. Let me do, see if do a stop share just to pause for a moment. Um, yes, I think some of you have seen that video. Um, and it's interesting how you can see the ridiculousness, some of the ridiculousness of it when it's flipped, right? Then it kind of becomes apparent. Um, glad that you heard it. Some of you, it's the first time seeing then. Yes, awesome. Perfect. All right, I'll continue. Um, I think we got maybe another 10, 15 minutes at most, and then we'll do questions. And it still happens all the time. Yeah. <laughs> And there's coping strategies for that. There's responses, you know, afterwards, I'm happy to give my own depending on the space that I'm in and, and how uh, punchy essentially I might feel as well. All right. So closing this piece is to just remind us we don't see everything. Meaning searching can conjure illusions. Our quick decisions can be seriously flawed and our memory reinforces this error. And that's important because this is how we see the world in particular ways. Uh, so the last piece is like the now what? So what are some things to, to, to begin to consider that you can do? Uh, reminder that because of this whole map, it's less helpful to say, well, let me just memorize all the biases and like be super careful and attentive to what comes up. Uh, good luck. Uh, it, it does, it's just going to be very difficult and challenging and, and may not be as productive. But you can begin to chunk and pay attention um to what some of them may come up for you and to pay attention depending of your positionality right You're, you might have a particular title or role you might hold particular power and privilege um to begin to consider that so this comes from the research um ucla uh, professor uh, matt um i forgot his last name but he he's a he's a newer researcher that studies his bias uh, and, and they broke this down as an acronym, COST, C-O-S-T. Uh, so um, in terms of corner cutting, objectivism, self-protection, time, and money. Uh, and for each of these, then, you can think about corning cutting types of biases. These are the shortcuts uh, that help us make quick and efficient decisions. 
which can be useful in some times. Our brain has made this useful. And an example of that, uh, for example, is availability bias, making a decision based on the information that comes to mind most quickly. So again, uh, those are examples in, in which many of us do that. Um, and so the mitigation, meaning like, okay, if I may find that I'm highly susceptible to this type of bias, then what I can consider when it says increased motivation to engage cognitive effort is take the time to think about it, <laughs> pause. Um, so consider all informations and alternatives, not just what's most readily accessible. You can then ask, do I have enough inputs of information? Do I have enough variety of information that I could maybe have not thought about this differently? Um, so these are different examples. And again, for all of these, we can follow up with resources. There's a really good article just on this um, that can help you um, break it down a little bit more. And so when it came to the Hubble time allocation process that I was talking to you about, they said they decided to be able to look like say, well, hmm, uh, we may not be paying attention that we're clearly looking at the names of, of, these, of, of, these, of these individuals in the proposals and who they are, and even that we might recognize them. Um, so they uh, tried a, a dual anonymous review, or sometimes it's called like a, like a um, they call it a double blind review, just to kind of see what happens. And what they ended up noticing was that in this case, for the early results, uh, for the first time in 18 years of relevant record keeping, the proposals with women principal investigators had a higher success rate than those led by men. Because what they were realizing was that this forced them to focus on what the actual proposal was, rather than uh, noticing the name uh, and the gender and not being aware of the bias that was creeping around that. So this is a really good contrast of that, right? And what it could do in terms of how it quote unquote leveled that playing field, not just for women, but for other uh, impacted or marginalized and disadvantaged groups. So that's an example of, the, of, of accounting for that type of, of mitigation. Um, and so some examples of these, here's another acronym, SPACE, <laughs> slowing down, so S-P-A-C-E, S, slowing down, P, perspective taking, A, asking yourself, C, cultural intelligence, and E, exemplars and expand. These can be, um, these actually make use of our own biases to use discrete chunking of information to help you kind of pay attention to be able to say, okay, um, maybe this is a good example for me to just kind of say, I can pause and slow down on my decision making. Not everything has to um, be made at the, at, at the urgency of the moment. And I say not everything because yes, you will still have times in which you need to quickly decide. And it's important to help train yourself and how you respond in emergency situations. Um, but there's, and that there's gonna be plenty of other times when you don't have to. And you can just say, yeah, give me a day to think about it. Or like, um, send me all the information that you have, and then I'm gonna ask so-and-so for their perspective on this as well. Then interrupting and reacting, that there's uh, all kinds of ways to approach this as well. Uh, practices, like you actually can role, role um, I would say role model, but role play, uh, ways to approach this in terms of have difficult conversations. Take a deep breath, or maybe remind yourself for your agreements with each other and say, like, we had agreed to support positive intent. So I'm really going to focus on the impact. I'm really going to focus on the behavior. Uh, or I'm going to lead with curious inquiry. And rather than saying, well, geez, like, you know, you are a biased fill in the blank. Be able to say, like, can you tell me more about that? Or like, I didn't find that as funny. Can you explain to me, like, you know, what makes it funny? Like all of a sudden, sometimes that stark contrast <laughs> will let kind of remind someone to kind of be like, okay, I had, I had not paid attention to how harmful that can be. Um, there's a lot of phrases, uh, and again, focus on actions and behaviors and impact. Um, you know, things like, you know, I was really upset when you said this, and was unable to hear the rest of what you said. Can we go back and discuss it? Um, that that made me bristle a little. Can you tell me what you meant? And these can be part of agreements, 
um, agreements. I think of agreements in like at least three categories. There's those that help us be efficient and successful, like how we manage time and so forth. There's those that help us um, in terms of how we're seen, heard, and valued, how we make space for others, especially that may have a very different lived experience and perspective than us. And then there's those on how to heal a harm, because it's not a question of if, but when you're going to mess up. So then what, how are we supporting each other in that messing up? Because if we don't, then it's not surprising that, um, that the consequences of that are just really hard. And so these are examples, uh, as was mentioned early, why you might frame call in versus call out. Those are all types of examples to really look at how do we have restorative and reparative processes uh, that will help us and deal with this when we are gonna um, have impact. Um, I wanna, and especially if you are being given the feedback, like you're the one that uh, messed up, to think about, to also practice that and pause it um, and just kind of acknowledge it and name it. This is hard for me and it's important you told me because I know it's important that we work together and that I, that I model with you what it's like to, to have less harm. Um, and some of those terms, some of those phrases, some of those framings, can be very new for a lot of people, especially we have a lot of cultural uh, norms <laughs> that value, you know, how you're supposed to be tough or, or, or not mess up or not make safe, uh, mistakes and so forth. Um, and to avoid kind of showing, saying things like, well, I didn't really mean it, or I'm sorry that you, you know, I'm sorry that you were offended, rather than saying, I'm sorry that I offended you. It's kind of like when we think about an apology and says, well, who's the apology for? If it's just to make yourself feel better, that's a very different point in purpose than actually um, I'm helping to restore a harm. And I'll close um, for this, we'll jump into questions that this accounts, uh, uh, this is how you can begin to account for an aspect of fragility. So, you know, this is, there's more around this, and, but I wanna mention it because when we're getting feedback around mitigating our bias, this stuff will come up. Like I'll feel something that feels uncomfortable. Uh, this is hard, I don't like hearing this. So when we hold a degree of power and privilege, and that privilege can be around those identities, it can be white privilege, it could be male privilege, it could be white male privilege uh, and so forth. It can be hard to get called on how we use and use that power get challenged on having that power, get asked to share that power, especially when we didn't even realize we had that power to begin with. When we say, well, I'm not privileged, I worked hard for, for, for this, um, and not acknowledge the fact that saying, well, yes, we all worked hard, but there's a difference in kind of swimming with the current than swimming against the current. Um, those are examples in which we ignore kind of the privileged components in which uh, the spaces um, our design with us in mind rather than not. And so actually I'll skip this. So lastly, uh, as another case study example, uh, now that you know the army has had a serious sexual harassment um, problem uh, for quite some time. And so doing sexual harassment training uh, was very difficult to implement. Um, so you could have the directive, but it's another thing to actually do it. And what they were trying uh, for, for what one of the attempts that they tried was to then keep the same training. So don't change anything about the training, but then just don't call it sexual harassment or sexual assault training and just call it leadership development training as a way to look at that bias um, that soldiers might have to see. They, they hear sexual assault and, and have the bias can came all like, oh, I don't want to go to that. Uh, or there's reasons to kind of then resist or prevent that. But then everybody wants to go to leadership development training um, and that, that the focus by saying, this is how it affects unit cohesion. And because then that's a common core and value that everybody has was a way to, to, to make some headway and at least begin to address and mitigate some of the bias um, that was found um, within that culture. I just want to put that in terms of like, acknowledging that even as we talk about this, we hold biases about uh, how we respond to some of the terms, our own experiences to quote unquote to DEI treatments, uh, our own experiences when we hear, let's talk about race. Uh, and some people will be really exciting and other people will be like, just kind of shut down and like close their brain to thinking. Um, and all of those have an impact and matter. 
So the workout is that I have this because, um, like I said, it's one thing to get your running shoes. <laughs> it's another thing to actually run. And it's another thing to actually run with the plan and purpose uh, and an intention of what you want to accomplish. But as you're running, that's physical discomfort. Um, that's what it is. You want to get faster? You're going you're gonna to feel the burn. You want to go uh, run longer? You're going to feel the burn. You want to run for a marathon? You want to train for something? You're going to feel the burn. Um, but we often don't say, great, time for, time for me to go put my body in a physical state of discomfort. You say, I'm going to go for my run. I'm going to go hit the trail. Uh, so in this work, we're going to feel the discomfort. So as long as you have it as part of a plan, know that that's, what helping, that's what's helping you be able to run longer, run faster, um, train, build the muscle. But it has to be part of the plan. If you've never done a marathon, if you've never run more than a mile, uh, and then you say, well, great, I guess I'm supposed to just do this. And so I signed up for a marathon tomorrow. Uh, that's a way that you can get hurt and maybe even hurt others. So it isn't just about saying, great, just go now, just go in and be anti-racist or like, great, now you know about bias. So just like go in and, uh, and do everything. Uh, that's like saying, go lift and go and lift the heaviest thing in the gym. And you've never done that. Right? Like we want to be considerate of that, but it also means you actually have to do the work. And this is why it's not enough just to do like a quote unquote implicit bias uh, training or workshop or awareness. It's like, how do I actually practice that? Um, and so that's part of the component that will uh, jump into the stress resistance and some of the questions as well. And so I put this on the change my mind because <laughs> uh, you, it's, challenging and difficult to actually have someone change your mind because as with bias we're saying we're predisposed to some information so you also have to have an element of being ready to have your mind changed and that's a key component for it all right so with that i will pause or stop jump into questions Thank you, Jose. You've gotten a lot of a lot of props. People are really enjoying the the content and your examples. Our first question came from Jasmine, and she asks, "How would you take these approaches in person as opposed to online?" And Jasmine, if you want to jump in and clarify, well, yeah, yeah, I think I think clarification would be helpful. Yeah, I mean, I think. Uh more so just online as to like social media. Um, I feel like sometimes it's really hard to communicate, uh, you know, through any form of online, especially on social media. And so sometimes I do want to be outspoken and vocal online, but I feel like my point won't get across or I, I've seen like just conversations not go down the right path on social media in, in many cases, not even related to myself. Yeah, I think that's, I see what you mean by online um, in terms of kind of the like social media space as an example of trying to hold these conversations. Uh, the, I, I will put this in this way. Uh, I don't have an easy answer for you because I think if I did, then we would have fixed all social media issues. Uh, what I will say is recognizing for me at least three things. Um, we are, there is the individual component, right? So I can then be able to say, this is my intent, so I, I, I'll pay attention to that. And then what awareness might I, what potential impact can happen from that? Um, because in other words, I might say, oh, cool. I am, for example, I wanna engage in anti-blackness. And then if I'm not black, I have to be ready to, to, to know that I might get feedback to call me in or out on something because I don't have that experience in the same way. So if I approach that by learning, then, then it lets me know, like, if I'm going to feel defensive or whatnot, I might just be able to say, thank you. Um, that's useful because I don't have that experience. So I'm saying that as that, that's, that's for me. The second level is the space. Social media is not really set up to have thriving, sustainable, uh, reflective, uh, safe conversation. It's not. It's designed to get your attention. It's designed to be reactionary. So... I then think about the boundaries that I want to have. So this is a, uh, this is why consent language and boundary sending is important um, to know when you you just need to to stop. Otherwise, don't be surprised that you've entered a space of harm. And um, if you don't get out of that, then that's what's going to happen. So with some engagements, I will then kind of say, 
hey, I would love to engage with you. Um, I'm leaning in with the spirit of curiosity and so forth uh, um, and being able to engage. And if we, and if I feel that we're being harmful to each other, I'm just gonna name it and, and that's the point for me to stop. Um, and then that's the last piece that you are in control of you. You are not in control of somebody else's reaction. And as soon as you think you're doing that or you try to do that, that's like you know, being in a bad relationship saying, well, I can change them, easy. I'm gonna show up and, and change their lives. You can't do that. They have to be willing. Uh, that's why I put that last one to do that. So just being cautious of that. And there's just times when I, I needed to, to step out. And sometimes it could still suck <laughs> and feel bad. It's like, oh, if only they really listened to my really cool argument that I had. Or, but this is a fact. How can you not engage with the fact? Um, so I'm just putting in, uh, some of that because then at the end I can say, well, did I honor my intention? Did I honor my own boundary setting? Uh, did I not think about some of the consequences for that? Then that's on me. Then I, then I can at least be accountable to myself on that. Thank you. Some great relationship advice in there too. <laughs> Major key. Okay, next question. What are some examples of things to say when you realize upon reflection that you've done or said something harmful but weren't being you weren't called in or out directly at the time? I'm wondering if there's a good way to raise that type of conversation after the fact when the context may be gone. Yeah, good question. Um, this is why the agreement setting is so important. And I think that if you've never done that, you know, like Alice, like in a, in a good relationship, <laughs> you 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 name those things, and it doesn't mean like, oh well, geez, let's have all possible agreements that will help us be better people. I usually think about what are the ones that I struggle with the most <laughs> that I could need help with, because then that helps build the interdependence relationship, um, so that when we do need to call each other in, it's because we're doing it to help each other, and and I actually believe that rather than it's like, oh, I'm getting called in, I'm gonna get something. So I say that because you might say like, oh shoot, I think, I don't think that was cool, but I didn't hear somebody call me in on that. Uh, so I'm not sure, but I think maybe I did. And that could be one of two things. One is the environment isn't trust. Um, there isn't enough trust <laughs> for somebody to, to wanna give you that gift of feedback. Uh, or two, it really was just a mess up that you caught and nobody else did as a big deal, but it's important to you to name it, then you can lean in with those agreements and be able to say, hey, I am, um, there's just something I, I wanna bring up. Uh, you know, I really wanna honor a, a agreement of like reducing harm and whatnot. And I said this thing and I don't, it doesn't sit right with me. I think it was harmful. Uh, can you give me any feedback? Right? And, then, and, 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 then, and, then, and then, and then that's a critical thing, just like an apology. Uh, you're not in control of the response. So it can be that they can be like, oh yeah, don't worry about it. Like, yeah, no, no that was nothing. And leave it at that, move on. Uh, or they can say, well, actually I'm glad you mentioned that because that was messed up. And I just, I, I, I don't like talking to you about this because you don't know how to handle it. Then, that, then you do, then you can kind of, that's a different type of feedback to sit with. Thank you, Jose. We have one question that was a, an actual question, but somebody brought up tone mm. in relation to social media. And I want to I want to go there because, um, yes, you can't hear tone in social media, but then there's often a conversation around tone policing. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd love for you to comment. Yeah, that's a great one as well. Um, and this is, uh, you know, this is when I said we're focusing on, on cognitive implicit bias, and then there's larger structures and conversations around dominant culture, dominant white culture, white supremacy culture, like all of these components. Uh, and, and then why I say that, because then things like tone policing is a component of that, but right? it isn't meant to say, well, your tone policing is not my tone policing. Um, that can be true. I think about that for me to be able to say, if I'm entering a space in which I, I hold a dominant identity and I'm making a conscious effort and agreement to not have, to not wield it in a way that's gonna perpetuate more harm, then I know I'm gonna agree to be able to say, let me pay attention and listen. And let me sit with this comfort that come from that. Um, because if I don't, then I am imposing a way that someone should react to how I think they should react rather than 
um, not paying attention to the fact that they may be at a point of expressing what's really important to them. So the tone is not the, the, the thing, it's what's the message. And then I can sit with that. So an example might that might be like my male fragility may show up if I see uh, somebody, uh, if I see a woman pose, well, all men are trash. And if I go in and say, but, hold, but not all men, I'm one of the good ones, right? I just prove their point <laughs> rather than, and so I'm already, you know, engaging in a type of tone policing as to how I think they should be communicating something that's important to them. Snaps on that. A question from Shelly. When someone being called out or in is dismissive and closed, is there benefit to continue? Or rather, what's the best way to navigate from there, especially when it's someone you otherwise and still respect other aspects of their being? Yeah, that's, that's also a good question. I um, Three big picture questions that we often ask in this work is say, uh, what power are you willing to give up? Um, and if not, then conversely, is what power are you holding on to in such a way that you might harm somebody else? Uh, and so that's a, that a lot can unpack from that. How do I react or respond to that question? What do, how do I interpret it? What power do I recognize and I'm willing to give up in that respect? Uh, the other one is in service of what? And the third one is kind of uh, what, what thrives and why? So I'm saying this because there's that sense of like, in service of what? What do I... Why do I care that this individual get it or not get it? Uh, and then why do I care about the other aspects of, 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 of who they represent? Do I find them insightful, useful, and so forth? Is it because I value this friendship so much that I'm willing to engage with a very difficult and challenging thing with them, um, like an intervention kind of sense? Because um, then you are agreeing to uh, receive a certain level of, of impact, maybe even harm. And sometimes you do that with close, you know, with loved ones and close ones. That's what you might, with family, you say, you know what, <laughs> we're both kind of hurt from this, but I love you too much to like, let this go. And other people, you might, it might be like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I can't answer that question. So I might just need to provide some space or disengage and understand that I'm noticing what's more important to me is that they, that I'm right, or that I'm being ego driven in such a way um, in terms of understanding that maybe I have outgrown this space, maybe I have outgrown this relationship. Thank you, Jose. And um, we can have one more question. There was part of somebody else's question that I'm just remembering, so I may be getting it wrong, but somebody said something to the effect of like, how do you not have unconscious bias, period? Um, and so I wanted you to yeah. address that. <laughs> uh, not be alive, I mean, not be human. <laughs> right. I, yeah, I say that with some humor, but I think that that's the thing to, to be able to say, like the, the bias isn't the, the issue or the unconscious bias isn't the question or the issue. It's completely ignoring um, how it can have impact and manifest itself. I would often use like a silly example to say like, I might be biased in such a way that that develops us as preferences for strawberry ice cream. Um, and that's fine. It's a problem then when I begin to think that all of you who like vanilla ice cream, there's definitely something wrong with you. And okay, now I've developed a prejudice, but then it's not discriminatory or, or oppressive until I'm the one in charge of everybody's ice cream. And you either enjoy your strawberry ice cream or not, because that's all you're getting. And in fact, those of you that are asking for vanilla ice cream, I'm gonna find ways to make sure that, you know, that things are difficult for you. And so I use that with humor, but we begin to see that in different manifestations. Jose, you are amazing. People are now just thanking you and now somebody wants ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> We've got just a few minutes left. If there's any additional question, please let me know. Um, otherwise, we've got the three such stretch sessions next week. Jose will be leading those. Um, we'll make sure that you have all of his information so you can also follow him on social. He is an incredible follower, as I mentioned. I'll actually drop the handle in here. Um, I think that's it. Great.
Yeah, I'll just close with two things. One is um, anything that you put in the chat that we didn't get to, uh, bring it into a stretch session because we'll have more time and conversation. Uh, two is knowing there are, um, part of this is incomplete thoughts and work. This, this doesn't just become a fixed thing. Uh, it's ongoing and whatnot. Um, and I also offer this with that, with that learning intention rather than like, I have the answer for you right here and this is all you need and it's fixed to go. So know that we, we unpack that together. Uh, and so my intention is to share my learnings as well as my stumblings so that hopefully you can stumble less that you, so that you can run longer and faster, but also ideally so that what we're leaving is in better service for those that, that, that continue after us. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you, Teresa, for making this connection to Jose. And um, yeah, see you all next week. Have a wonderful evening. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye. Jose, you're so awesome. <laughs> uh, thank you. I'll stick around for a couple minutes as, as we're closing out. If... Yeah, just I'll do the same. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, I mean, I also, I love um, all the humor. Like it's, your memes are so incredible. <laughs> like that video, <laughs> I was dying. <laughs> that one yeah, doesn't get old. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Abby, for your help. I guess we'll um, we'll sh we'll close it down. Thanks all. Great. Right. Okay. Yeah, we'll follow up. Great job, Jose. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. See you next week. <laughs>